of going through the divorce and her credit being uh, messed up through that process, she ended up losing her job. And that's all she had ever done. And so she lost all of her income, became homeless for the first time in her life. She was devastated, absolutely devastated. So one of the myths about homelessness is that we assume that people are uneducated or they're incapable, and there are real-life things that are happening to people um, where they are really just trying to get back on their feet or overcome what they've gone through. So, yeah, absolutely. So let me ask you this. You uh, uh, you have a, um, I guess, a non-for-profit. Is that called Glory Soldiers? Yeah, Glory Soldiers Global. So mm-hmm. talk a little bit about that. So we started Glory Soldiers Global. It really, for us, is a ministry. Um, it is a way for us to help people that are overcoming the effects of child sexual abuse. And when I say that, I'm really referring to a statistic that shows that 97% of homeless mothers have experienced child sexual abuse and or rape. And that is an alarming number of homeless mothers that have this kind of trauma. So um, I actually wrote in my memoir about my own experience with having been sexually abused and the process of overcoming it. And what I realized is that it did lead to adult homelessness. People who have functional, intact, healed, and hold whole families and relationships are not homeless. Now, that doesn't mean that it's all the homeless person's fault, but there are many reasons why, um, you know, if, if you were to go homeless tomorrow, you may not be able to go and stay with someone who you think today you would be able to rely on. Yeah. So, you know, there there are some different things that we offer in terms of housing programs. We um, have a housewarming uh, party social, which is a signature of ours. Uh, and then I do a lot of praying and coaching and We've done marital counseling and, you know, some stuff you just don't put on the website, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but there's a lot of a lot of support services that we've offered. And, and many times people will call me, even from different states, and say, I'm homeless. I don't really know how to overcome this for good. You know, what do I do? And I get to help them navigate through the system. And, it, and there may be some things that they just did not know they were doing in error. So you're also uh, going to be going on a tour soon, correct? Yeah, I've, it started. <laughs> oh, it started. So what did, when did it start? Um, I don't, you know, honestly, I can't remember what my first date was. But I did just get back from Mississippi and uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. I had uh, some media to do there. I was on TV there and um, met with some folks there, and then I do some college speaking as well. So I'm going on a a tour where I'm going to be uh, adding some additional services and doing some mastermind coaching and that kind of thing too. So I'm really excited about it. But we've already started. I've been in Pennsylvania and, honey, where else? (laughs) Mississippi, Charlotte and a couple other places that are escaping me. And one of your stops is going to be the Chicago location, correct? We would love to come to Chicago. I'm waiting to get booked. I'm actually praying to get booked at a a church there. Um, So, so yeah. Yeah, Um, Working on Chicago. Resurrection, can you let people know where they could get your memoir from? Is it on Amazon.com? It is. Um, if you go to Amazon.com, you can look up the title of the book. It's called Identity Crisis, Identity Christ is a Journey to Love. Okay. And so, you know, and you can just, go ahead. No, I was going to say you could just um, look it up on Amazon from there. And um, I have a revised version of the book that is available now. So very excited about that. It's a picture of me, and I I look like I am uh, a child. So I was four years old. And you look the same way, by you. <laughs> exactly <laughs> the same way. So, so I want to I want to oh. I want to ask you this question now. You would say that you know you would you never would be happy about being in a shelter, but the Lord blessed you so much from that shelter experience. 
Uh, can you talk a little bit about how sometimes you can be in a negative environment and still receive a blessing from the Lord? I know, you know, David, you know, there's a lot of people. Joseph didn't want to be in this situation as well. But, Joe. you know, you know, we, we get into situations that God allows us to be in and then he strengthens us through it. So talk about how you were strengthened through that situation. You know, that is a really good point, thinking about Joseph and, and Job, too. <laughs> uh, for me, it was really just, and, and I know I sound redundant, hearing from God. That was a huge lesson for me, though, because, you know, we go to church, we sit in the pew, we write down what the pastor says, and uh, if we do that. And then many times, you know, we don't hear from God for ourselves. Right? So when you get into these challenging situations, if you if you don't have relationships and you're depending on everybody else to have an answer for you, it makes it very difficult for you to have that one-on-one with God. And so for me, what actually was going on is that I did have a relationship with God, but people were inserting their opinion on how I should lo- live, you know, where I should be, what should happen and so on and so forth, and I really just needed to hear from God. And when I was able to learn that lesson, it wasn't confusing. In other words, I would hear from God, and then so-and-so would say this, and -and so-and-so would say that, and it would be a collective of voices. And God is God all by himself. Amen. He doesn't need, you know, cheerleaders and people to, you know, validate what he's saying, right? And so um, I really realized, and this kind of, (laughs) we're being a little transparent here, um, I really needed to be able to hear from God and that be enough and not care what other people would have to input. Yeah, and and that's great because, you know, a lot of people will make comments about things, but all you have to do is listen to the voice of God and he will direct Mm -hmm. your path. And so in that situation where some people were talking to you, I'm sure that may have been some people that you knew or that you had some respect for. How was it? Was it difficult for you in some cases uh, going through the situation and trying to decipher what voice to listen to? Or was always a point in your life that you just knew that it was just God's voice and his alone? Yeah, I think that's a great question. So let let me kind of dig deeper and clarify here. I could hear the voice of God, but what was affecting me was the negative comments and the negative things that were being said. So as an example, there were church people that were saying, kind of dismissing the fact that I was homeless, saying, so, well, so-and-so is homeless, I mean, and they're okay. You know, well, so-and-so is this, and that's okay. And I had a couple people to say to me, well, Jesus was homeless. You know, <laughs> so you know, you hear all of these different things, and in the midst of what you're going through, you almost can't see a way out, but you know there is one because you know God. And so it was a challenge for me to kind of work through that. For the listening audience, for people that are listening in that might be homeless and just trying to figure it out, I don't know what that thing is for you, but there may be something that God is developing in you so that when you overcome it, you will also overcome homelessness. may not be what you want to hear, and and I remember actually thinking this as the revelation came while I was homeless. Like, really, God? Seriously? You can't just tell me this in a house? <laughs> but there are some things that you go through that that experience will help develop you into the man or woman of God that he called you to be. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I'm, we're, I just want to ask you a couple more questions with you and your mm-hmm. husband. Uh, the relationship, you know, it developed, you know, you're in a homeless situation. Things become difficult. How did you all make it through um, your situation with each other? You met each other in the homeless uh, location. How did you make it through that situation to come from where you were to where you are now? It did not take long. So I can't remember what you asked a few minutes ago, but um, it, I was going to say that, that it didn't take long for us to, after we met, leave the homeless shelter. It was, and, and I believe this, that we're on assignment. So 
So I didn't go there because I was supposed to go through this long, drawn-out, you know, continued long suffering. I was there because I was supposed to meet him, and then when that happened, it activated something, and we just were able to be delivered out of that situation. That he had resources, I had resources. We were able to put those resources together, um, and that helped us. You know, I had some strengths, he had some strengths. We worked together so that we could apply them to both of our situations, and, and that really helped us. About five months into dating, you know, I said to him, okay, what are we doing? And um, he actually got an offer, an opportunity, and they said in order for him to accept it, he needed to be married. And so we had we had actually already talked about marriage. We knew that we were the one for each other um, shortly before that, but we had planned the wedding out, you know, uh, there was some time between when we were going to get married. And long story short, um, he was sort of given this opportunity, and he came to me and he said, I don't want to live without you. Amen. Like, we have, we have two weeks. Yeah. <laughs> so, and that completely called my bluff. Because, <laughs> you know, I kept saying, Lord, I'm going to be married. I want to be with the one you want me with, Jesus. And then, you know, he said, okay, cool, we have two weeks. And, and you know, I felt no red flag, not and, one. And, and I know, said, this, this is the one. And God can give an answer in two weeks, that's for you sure. You know, well, she, she making a lot of women kind of jealous, though. They, they've been dating men for 10 years, and they ain't even proposed to them. So you got two weeks, we're going to do this thing. Hey, what God has for you know is for you. So let me ask you, we, how- we, how long we we been... dated. Let me clarify. We we dated like five five months, and <laughs> and then during that time, so before it got to six months, is when he came and he said, "Okay, we got two weeks." <laughs> so how long you've been married? Um, it's been a couple of years now. We're mm-hmm. coming up on the anniversary soon. Um, oh, he's get pointing fingers. Three years. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so let me. I, I want to take. I want to take you back just a little bit because I know you was telling me you 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 had your daughter and she you know she's older now. Can you talk yeah. to a little bit about to young ladies who are in shelters you know with their children you know give the kind of uh, of a psyche of how you can survive with that because now you've got someone else that is depending on you and in some in some yeah. cases a lot of people feel. When they're in that situation, they they fail, then they're down and they're miserable. That's that's just them by themselves. Now I've got a responsibility mm-hmm. of a child. How did mm-hmm. you survive that situation? Not only by being by yourself, but now you have a responsibility of someone else. Yeah. So here's the thing: may not be a popular opinion, but I knew that it was important for me to be mommy first. So when um, I had to close my business, lost my home, my daughter, I believe, was 13. That is a very, very critical age. And I did not want for what was going on at home to send her out in the street. And so I decided to be mommy first. I focused on her emotions, not mine. I made sure that I answered her questions about God. I made sure that I was prayed up when I was not around her. If I needed to start crying or ball out crying or, you know, kind of take a moment to myself, I did that, but I just didn't do it in front of her. Hey, Resurrect. Go ahead. uh Uh, I just wanted to tell you because, you know, we're about to go to a break. Tell me just in a little bit uh, about uh, Glory Soldier again before we go. Yeah, Glory Soldiers Global is a organization that works with homeless people that were once uh, sexually abused, and we also work with homeless entrepreneurs. And I know we didn't get to that, yeah. But that's just, that's what we do. We work with people that uh, pastors pray for over the pulpit. Send me the druggers and the prostitutes, and the, that's who we work with. Amen. Hey, you know, we're thankful that you called. Hold on for a second. We're gonna go to commercial break. This is the Let's Stay Together show with Reverend Rick McCain, along with my baby, my girl, my boo, Arthur Brendan McCain. We'll be right back. This is Brendan McCain from the Let's Stay Together talk show. 
Volunteers This Week announced.